tell us a little bit about the, uh, the impact that the initial results of the Physicians Health Study had in, in the US and elsewhere? Well, it, it did get a lot of attention. I was very lucky that that was just about the time that I had arrived with the group um, in 1989 that the results came out. And um, it, it was n novel in a number of ways. First, it was the first study in people who didn't have cardiovascular disease, you know, answering a, a novel question. And then it was done in a novel way with 22,000 physicians. Uh, physicians often asked people to be part of studies, but this was one where the physicians were the, the uh, uh, participants in the project, and they, they were very excited about that. And the third in innovation was that it was, it was done to keep the cost down entirely by mail. So it did get a, a bit of attention. Yeah, and the effect on, uh, on the risk of MI, particularly non-fatal MI, was probably fair to say larger than people were expecting at that stage. Yes, it was. About a 44% reduction in the risk of a first heart attack. So the, the question was, um, uh, is the uh, treatment with aspirin after you have an event um, going to operate the same way in people before they've had an event? And uh, it turned out that the, that the answer was a resounding yes, that it does prevent events. Um, but it, there were much greater challenges in, in uh, identifying the, the, f the population, right population, um, and studying first events because uh, yeah. they're much rarer. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, to have enough heart attacks, that's why we had to have a study that was m multiples of any previous studies before that. And how much of the, the impressive effect of aspirin, particularly on MI, was down to the sort of the trial discipline? You had very high rates, I know, of, uh, of concordance with randomized treatment, which has been a, a problem right. for some other trials before and since. Yeah. And it, it surprises me that you managed to get 22,000 doctors to do what they were told for, for five years. Yeah, and, well, you uh, know, it's tough for, for all of the... Uh, the uh, the participants are often willing, but it's just a matter of can you get them to do it. Now, the couple of things that were done to try to get them to comply was um, that we the the um, study drugs were given out as calendar packs, so they just punched the calendar pack once a day, and it was easy to see if that's sitting on your medicine cabinet whether you remember to do it or not. It's staring you in the face, and 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 if it's if that if Tuesdays is is still in the pack. By the time you're brushing your teeth at night, you've forgotten it, so it's time to, time to take it. The second innovation that, uh, that Charlie Hennikins you know, put in was, uh, was something that was done in some trials, but never on this scale, which was a run-in. They were sent out calendar packs of, of actually dummy pills for, for the beta carotene, but they were actually real aspirin. So they wanted to see for about you know, eight or ten weeks. You know, could could these people take the study pills? And um, about a third of them that were eligible and willing were unable to um, to participate. So we start off with thirty-three thousand um, that said they'd love to give it a go. And at the end of the day, after the run-in, twenty-two thousand were able to comply. So that's how we were able to maintain such high rates of compliance for for the, five, the average of five years. And I suppose you could almost do the back calculation and say, well, what if those patients, what if you hadn't had the run-in, they'd been randomized, and then you'd had that sort of noise in the background. Exactly. Your 44% might have come down to about 25, 30% possibly. Absolutely. That's exactly what you would have seen if, you'd, if, if people had been you know, considerably less compliant than they were the effect that we would have observed would have appeared to be a lot less. Mm. Well, that was, I mean, that's in a sense what the Physician's Health Study is most famous for, that landmark result for aspirin. But obviously it was looking at other things too. Tell, tell us a bit more about the, the, the vitamins and beta carotene side of what happened then and what's happened subsequently. Yeah, so the physicians turned out to be a pretty good group to, to study and we held the group together for now 33 years. We continue to get information from them. Um, which gave us an opportunity to, to not only do that original trial, but to do subsequent ones. And in both the original trial and the subsequent ones, we turned our attention to other things that you could do safely by mail, and it was to address the question 
uh, vitamins, um, beta carotene, vitamin E, vitamin C, and a multivitamin were all studied over the course of the 30 years that, that the group was involved in, in trials by mail. In that first trial with aspirin, we also did a beta carotene study. There was a lot of information suggesting that beta carotene might prevent cancer. Um, we continued that well beyond the, the stopping of the aspirin part, and we actually continued that for 12 years. And people forget that uh, beta carotene, there was a lot of excitement around that time about the observational epidemiology, and uh, was, was there an expectation that you might well get a, a positive result out of that? Yes, well, I'd say the same for vitamin E in the 90s, when we added that to the, the later trial. Um, and I think it's a, it, it, it highlights the importance of doing randomized trials. Mm -hmm. The observational data for both beta carotene and for vitamin E were very promising in preventing cancer and cardiovascular disease respectively, but the randomized trials didn't bear that out. So we felt it was of, of public health importance because unlike prescription drugs, you can just go out and buy vitamins and there were a lot of people in the States and around the world that were we're, we're um, going out and buying the vitamins, so we felt it was important to, to get a more definitive answer than the observational studies were able to provide. Well, the physicians, of course, included mostly men. There were very there were male physicians, and there was a big feminist movement at the time and the thought that, you know, we need to now start doing trials in women. I don't think the physician's health study could be done at this point um, with just men. Um, so we needed to do some uh, trial in women. Now, it's interesting that at the time, of course, physicians used a dose of 325 milligrams every other day. And our original plan for the women's health study was to use that dose to use a lower dose of 100 milligrams and a placebo. So it was supposed to be a three-arm trial. But even though people were calling for research on women, they, the reviewers said that, well, we already know what happens with 325 milligrams, so they wouldn't let us conduct that trial. So they only gave us funding for a two-arm trial of 100 milligrams every other day. Um, so that's what happened and how the Women's Health Study got started. And the every other day is, is, is an interesting mm -hmm. issue, which uh, um, and the two, the two big American trials right. went with. Was, was that something, again, that you, you were keen to do or was that something that uh, happened for more pragmatic reasons? It was really pragmatic because um, phys the physician's health study had two um, interventions, aspirin and beta carotene. So the thought was that people would take one pill a day. And they did some pilot testing and were looking at platelet uh, aggregation and found that the every other day dose seemed to to do a good job on platelets as well. So they figured that would be adequate for aspirin and the cardiovascular disease endpoint. Um, so that was continued over into women's, which of course had um, beta carotene and vitamin E as well, but they, they would alternate the vitamins with aspirin. Mm. So it was mainly for convenience. I think if there were trial, trials were designed today, it would be every other every day doses. Mm. But I think there's no there's no reason why the effect of every day would be different to alternative no. as you say for no for you wouldn't think reasons. so especially for um, for its effects on the platelets yeah. and the vitamin side of the trial was mm -hmm. that something you did because you you could and you thought we might as well or or I, I know mm -hmm. at that time there was a great excitement about vitamins right. and cancer so that right. was a that was an important part of the rationale rather than just a, an add-on. Right, exactly. At the time, there was, at the time the physician study was being designed, there was a lot of research on beta carotene. Green leafy vegetables are supposed to be good for you, particularly against cancer. And um, it was interesting that in the course of the trial, the hypothesis of, of beta carotene and the fruits and vegetables with cardiovascular disease developed, as well as the hypothesis for aspirin and cancer. So besides the main endpoints for each intervention, there was also a, a crossover in that respect. But uh, so there was a lot of interest in beta carotene and several other trials at the time. Now, at the time that um, women started, the physician was, was kind of winding down, but the full results weren't known for beta carotene. So women's also included a beta carotene arm. But that was stopped after two years once physicians ended and several of the other trials saw no effect of beta carotene on these outcomes. So that was dropped, but the vitamin E hypothesis continued. 
And in fact, that one continued into the physician's health study too as well. Yeah. Um, so we're aware of Mike at all some, found some other interesting effects. Mm. No, absolutely. Yeah. And the, the logistics <coughs> of a 40,000 mm. patient trial mm -hmm. with, with mm -hmm. continued treatment out to 10 years, I mean, it's almost something right. that people said you can't do trials mm -hmm. that long, particularly of that right. size. It must have been a, a, an undertaking to keep people on board for that length right. of time. Well, we had unique cohorts. The Physicians Health Study obviously used physicians, and they got names and addresses from the AMA. Um, for the nurses, it was a little different. There was no national database, and we had to go to the, all the individual states to get information from the, the uh, individual nursing boards. But we, we, we did that, and we acquired these, and they're really great participants. Um, we knew from the Nurses' Health Study that the women were really eager to participate. They were good participants. They would return their questionnaires. They would be compliant with what they were asked to do. So in that sense, it made it easier because it was a very good group. It was not um, a general population group. It was people who were really interested in health, and they were, you know, they were active, and they were, they were compliant with the interventions. So you know, we, asked, we had to ask them to continue at, at five years, and that people could opt out at that time if they wanted to. And then, in fact, even once the trial ended, we asked if we could continue observational follow-up past 10 years. Um, the trial ended, so they didn't have to take pills. But, you know, most of them did. About almost 90% of them agreed to continue answering questionnaires, which was very valuable. That's impressive. And even the, op the opt-out rate at year five was, was l relatively right. low, that wasn't was, it? That was low, right. Yeah. yeah, no, it's very impressive, yeah. and and also the the cost of doing the trial mm -hmm. to do a ten year trial in uh, in forty thousand people. Yeah. If this was a pharmaceutical company trial, uh, you'd be talking, I'm sure, about somewhere between two hundred and three hundred million right. dollars. Do you it know, was do you very have any economical, of, just of, like of physicians. How much it costs? Uh, everything was done by mail, so we didn't have clinic visits, we didn't have other physician costs. Um, and probably it was because we had health professionals there, particularly for physicians but also the nurses, and that they could recognize if there were problems, particularly for aspirin. Mm -hmm. We weren't so worried about the vitamins um, because, you know, those are well known. They're not, um, they're sold over the counter. So is aspirin, but aspirin has some other side effects, so we wanted to make sure that um, people would be able to report that and would be able to do something if they saw that. So. Um, it was very helpful to have health professionals and do everything by mail. So I think, I think the quote that it was less than fifty dollars per year per participant. <laughs> so it was, it was quite economic. And that, and a, it was one of the first trials I think to sort of popularize that uh, mm -hmm. trial by mail methodology. Right. With yeah. uh, I know that the uh, the British Doctors Study in the UK done it roughly at the same time had a mm -hmm. similar methodology, mm -hmm. but. I think they were some of the first to do yes, large-scale right. trials uh, right. in that incredibly value-for-money sort of way. Right. Well, Charlie Henkin had spent time there in Oxford mm -hmm. with Richard Pito and Sir Richard Dahl, and so he learned about their methods of doing that and started the Physician's Health Study. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and they went, went back to the States and did it bigger and better. Uh -huh. So it's uh, uh -huh. something we've seen before. <laughs> so you, you've obviously continued to uh, follow the cohort and you, mm -hmm. you're now looking at cancer outcomes and, and other outcomes mm -hmm. as well as the initial uh, right. vascular rationale. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that, I, I'm right, I think, in saying that was always a rationale. You always had the intention of looking at some of these other outcomes from the beginning. Right. Um, well, we were, for cancer, we were particularly interested in, in types of cancer. And we knew we wouldn't have enough of those types of events, even after 10 years. We had many uh, types, of, we had many breast cancer reports, um, but some of the smaller types of cancer we're still interested in following, and, and they're more rare, so we wouldn't have enough even after the 10 years of the mm -hmm. trial. So, plus, for cancer, we we're interested in a latent effect mm -hmm. um, because the process of carcinogenesis takes so long, so we definitely wanted to follow them for a longer time. Women get MIs later in life, about mm -hmm. 10 years later. And we saw, actually, in the women over age 65 at baseline, we actually did see some effect of aspirin mm -hmm. on cardiovascular disease. Um, we didn't see any in the younger women. So, you know, it's possible that there was an effect even on MI later on mm -hmm. um, at the time when women do develop uh, cardiovascular disease. So it's you know, there's possible there is an effect of, of the aspirin on cardiovascular disease. It might occur later. 
And again, the dose question is there. Um, so the, the Women's Health Study had a lower dose, so it's possible that we would have seen something earlier or stronger if we had the larger dose. The Physician's Health Study had an active run-in, so anyone who had acute um, problems with aspirin would not be randomized, um, whereas in the, the Women's Health Study, it was placebo. But it was lower dose, so that the effects would be uh, smaller too, likely. You know, one thing that's, uh, that's you know, always intriguing by trials is that, uh, that you end up with a healthier segment of the population that is eligible because we didn't want people with previous disease and willing. There's a, what we call a healthy volunteer effect, that the healthiest side of the population volunteers. What that means is that you end up with fewer bad outcomes. Well, it's those bad outcomes that you're trying to study, and it does make the epidemiologist's job a little harder. And I think that, you know, we were, we were a bit surprised by how well these physicians did. And the, for instance, the, the mortality rate uh, in, from cardiovascular disease in the physicians in that first five years during the aspirin study was 15% of what you would have expected for the average U.S. male population of that age. Well, I think that the design of the women's health study would have been different. It would have been very nice if we had those three arms because then we would be able to, because now the results in women for cardiovascular disease at least are a little bit different than in men. Mm -hmm. And we don't know if it's because it's women or because of the dose is lower. So it would be nice to be able to answer those types of questions.